I love building quadcopters almost as much as I, maybe more than I love flying them. <laughs> And it's especially fun when all of the parts for a build come from the same vendor and are kind of designed to work together. Yeah, it can be fun cobbling together all the parts to make the best, but did you watch my Acrobrat build? Sometimes you just pick all the wrong parts and it's a kind of a disaster. The parts for today's build are sent to me by Newbie Drone. And I'll tell you the real reason that I want to do this build is to check out these smooth motors. What is going on with the magnets on this motor? Or is it magnet or magnets? Is there... That's what we're going to talk about. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Here are the parts that are going to go into this build. Flight controller and ESC are going to be the Newbie Drone Infinity, and these are going to be 20 millimeter not 30 millimeter in size because on the newbie drone vivid frame a whole lot of the frames of real estate is taken up by the dji air unit yes the newbie drone vivid frame is designed to carry the dji air unit and it has a pretty cool metal bracket mechanism that holds the air unit really securely this is one of the first frames i've seen that is designed from the ground up with the dji air unit in mind and it's not just kind of like a retrofit of an existing frame where they just stretched it out to make room for the air unit and for those of you who are rolling your eyes at this point and going, oh my God, another build with the DJI air unit in it. When Newbie Drone first proposed that I do this build, I said, sure, but I've been so many DJI builds, I'd, I want to put an analog camera in it. And they said, but the frame is specifically designed for DJI. And I said, fine. I do have a new budget build series coming up in just uh, less than a month on the channel. And that will be an analog build. So my next and biggest build series will be analog, but this one's going to be DJI. And if that means you're tuning out right now, so be it. So what in the heck is going on with the magnet or magnets on this motor bell? What's going on here is there's a technique whereby you can 3D print magnetic material with custom arrangements of positive and negative poles. So although this looks like a single magnet, in fact, it acts just like the magnets that are normally on a typical motor bell. In fact, there are 14 magnets in here. For those of you who are trying to do Betaflight RPM filtering with this motor and wondering how the heck do you do it, the correct number of poles is 14, just like any other typical motor of this size. So if this magnet is electrically and magnetically the same as having 14 discrete magnets, What's the advantage? What is Newbie Drone going for here? We're going to find that out as I actually fly this quad, but I do have some ideas. One idea is that by having a single piece of material, the same density, the same thickness all the way around the bell, it may be a little bit easier to balance the bell. You can see that there is some balancing mud here. You might have thought maybe that that was some kind of adhesive to hold it in place. No, it's not. That's balancing mud. So they are balancing these and that makes sense. There's no way you could just manufacture it to such tolerances that it would be perfectly balanced at 30,000 RPM. So they are still having to balance them, but it may be that having a single piece like this is easier to get very precisely balanced than having 14 individual ones. Another question that I've got is, do you think this is going to be more durable? Because if you look at a typical motor, there's spaces in between the magnets. And the spaces in between the magnets, the only thing reinforcing the bell is this thin aluminum uh, piece of the bell, the outer piece. If you have a solid piece all around the inside, I wonder if that sort of reinforces cylinders are strong because no single part of the cylinder is going to bend or bow right? Whereas if you have a cylinder with a gap, it can, it can bend at that location. I wonder if these are going to be stronger. I wonder if they're going to be weaker though, because that flex that a typical aluminum bell might have in between the magnets, maybe that's just enough flex to keep it from deforming. And maybe we're going to find that this magnetic material sh shatters or something on a crash. All remains to be seen. The first decision we got to make about this build is whether we're going to put the air unit in the front or in the rear. And I think I'm going to put it in the rear. I think maybe the routing of the antennas is going to be a little easier that way. 
I don't know. I'm not sure one's better than the other, but that's where my gut tells me it should go. So that's how we're going to build up the frame. The arms on the Vivid are boomerang style, and I think we have to give credit to Bob Ruge, inventor of the, the floss and the toothpick. He was the first frame designer I know of to make this decision, and I'm sure you'll tell me in the comments if he wasn't the first, but regardless, he certainly gets some credit for popularizing it. A lot of frames come with individual arms, which means it's easy to change an arm if you break one, but also means that you often get some slop and some wobble. This sort of it's kind of a trade-off. You get much more rigidity than individual arms, but if you break one arm, you have to change two. Anyway, that's the trade-off they've made. I kind of like this design. Now, here's a common mistake that people often make. The base plate has press nuts pre-installed. The screws need to come in from this side of the press nuts. If you put the screws in from this side, it will all work until you yank the press nuts out. The press nuts can be can't be pulled out from the bottom, so make sure you get that right. We're gonna take this bottom piece and we're gonna take that 12 millimeter screws. There is a forward facing arrow on this cross piece, so make sure you get that facing forward. And this is the forward of the uh, base plate. Uh, it has kind of a long nose to push the camera out ahead of the props so you don't get props in view. I'm just gonna keep this loosely inserted until the whole thing goes together. arms are symmetrical. They don't have an up or down, so don't worry about putting them in upside down. There is no upside down. And it looks like we can go ahead and crank these down now. It doesn't look like anything else depends on this step. I see. So it looks like if you mount the air unit forward, then the, two, the DJI antennas kind of come off the arm. If you mount the DJI air unit in the back, the antennas come off the back. That may factor into your decision of where to place the air unit. Um, having the antennas come off the arms puts them lower. You get worse reception, but they're better protected from damage. Having them come out the back, you get better reception, but they're a little more susceptible to damage. We're now going to take the six millimeter screws. Again, there are only two sizes, so these are the short ones. And we're going to take one of the standoffs, put... Uh, one standoff on either side of the front. <laughs> if it sounds, I don't know if the mic is picking this up, but if about every two minutes it sounds like someone is flushing a toilet, then it's actually, it's raining buckets outside. And that is my sump pump pushing the, keeping my basement from flooding. Um, I just thought I'd point that out in case the mic makes it sound like Someone is repeatedly going to the bathroom and you guys are wondering what the hell is going on. Okay. <laughs> We're going to mount the camera, the 3D printed camera mount. You can kind of see how it's gone here. With the flat side on the inside and the contoured side on the outside. Now we've got these metal standoffs for the DJI Air Unit. And I want you to see here that they've got these little tabs on them. And those are going to fit down into holes in the base plate. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our air unit and we're going to snug it in to this little these standoffs here. And then we're going to install the front standoffs. I guess we'll have to push that little screw down out of the way and kind of try to get it in there. Oh, okay. Now it looks like Okay, so apparently you could do three of them and then tighten the fourth one down. Yeah, so you can put that corner in here and then it can kind of snug in there. Let's see what happens when we get the fourth one done. Now I'm going to tighten all these down and see how, how secure it seems. The instruction manual says that there is a TPU piece. Like it looks like it's kind of like just a shock absorbing piece that fits onto the bumper, onto the onto the standoff, but I don't see that in any of the other builds that I see online. It does have some play. I wonder if that's what these little pieces are for. They are not TPU, but maybe they're designed to take some of that play out. Let's see if that, let's try that. I'm gonna take this little piece that I got. I'm just gonna cut it in half. And I'm gonna kind of put it on the inside here. I guess I could fold it. Yeah. I'm gonna 
do that to two of these standoffs. Okay, so can I still, like that, and then, so now it's gonna push the goop out of the way, and I don't want that, so I gotta loosen that. And I think the thing to do is to put the sticky part on the back, which is, yeah. Let's take the sticky part and stick it on the back. And then kind of jam it in there. Yeah. Oh, that's better. Yeah. I can already tell that's better. All right. That's much more secure, although not completely secure, but... Pretty good, I think. Yeah, I don't know if that's how it's supposed to be done, but that's, that's how I've done it. Okay, I just realized that I, these are not in the right place for configuration two. They're gonna get in the way of the ESC. These actually go in the rear one, and we're gonna use these longer screws. Yeah, that makes plenty of room for the flight controller and ESC. I am usually not a fan of having stack screws go through the arms because it means you have to take the whole stack out in order to change an arm. In this case, they've managed to avoid having the stack screws go through the screws go through the arms. The stack screws do go into a standoff, but that's not a big deal. You take the screw out, the standoff is still held in by the top plate, and you could easily change the arm. I am really thrilled that this comes with its own mounting hardware and it comes with metal mounting hardware. Nylon mounting, st nylon stack hardware, it just breaks. Now this is M3. Why is it M3 if there's 20 millimeter holes? Because these 20 millimeter holes are, for real, M3. But your own, your own frame, there still is not a universal standard among manufacturers whether 20 millimeter boards should have M3 screws or M2 screws. This 20 millimeter Infinity uh, ESC and the equivalent flight controller have M3 screws. Okay, fine. But the frame is drilled for M2 screws on its 20 millimeter holes. So... Basically, I guess you could use them, but they'd flop around. You'd need a basically like a TPU insert, and that's okay. It is a little weird. I mean, newbie drone, it's your frame, it's your flight controller. Shouldn't they work together? Anyway, whatever, it doesn't matter because I also have a 30 millimeter version, so we can continue. We're gonna go a screw and then an M3 nut as a spacer to keep the ESC off the carbon, and that'll also hold the screw in. Times like this, I wish I had a battery-powered driver to drive the screw all the way through. There's another good question that people sometimes ask as to whether you should have screws all the way through the stack like you see me doing here, or whether you should have a standoff with a threaded piece and another standoff with a threaded piece. There are pros and cons to each. If you go with individual standoffs, they're going to, always going to be nylon standoffs and they're going to be more likely to break and you're going to end up with your flight controller kind of flapping in the wind. On the flip side, with this setup, if you do need to replace your ESC, for example, there's no way to avoid having to pull your whole flight controller off and just disassemble the whole stack. You probably were going to have to do that anyway, though. There's no question that having a single screw through the whole stack is much more durable it also transmits more shock and vibration to the flight controller and ESC, though, than having individual nylon standoffs. But since basically all ESCs and flight controllers today come with gummies in them, that's really not an issue. And in case you ever wondered why ESCs come with gummies, flight controllers have gyros, so they need vibration isolation. But why do ESCs have gummies? They don't need vibration isolation. Yes, but they do need shock isolation. It helps them avoid being damaged in a crash. So here are the stack screws installed, one, two, three, four. Notice I am not using this slotted standoff, which would be used if I was doing a front mount. There we go. And I suppose I should probably solder up the ESC, the XT60, before I mount this guy in the frame because it'll be a little fiddly getting my soldering iron in there. So I'm just gonna 
I'm going to turn it sideways just to make it easier to get at and hold it in place. And I'll solder that on. I'm very pleased that the ESC comes with a pre-made pigtail. This is the kind of thing that I definitely would make myself, but it's nice not to have to. Soldering iron at 850. Just crank that baby as high as it'll go. This comes pre-tinned. You definitely can add some fresh solder. It's always a good idea. The solder that they use in the factory is always lead-free because they have to uh, comply with a thing called ROHS, which is for industrial application, and basically they're not allowed to use lead leaded solder. But we are and we should. Don't worry. There's very little exposure to you and is a tiny you as an individual are putting a tiny tiny amount of lead in like landfills don't freak out so just use leaded solder all right this stuff is called blue tack or fun tack this the one i'm using is made by loctite but it's available all over the place and I think I'm going to run these off the side because they're going to come out the side here. And let's make sure we get the... Huh, that's annoying. So the plus and the minus aren't marked here. They are marked here. Plus and minus. And it's kind of silly because normally the positive pad has the shunt resistor. See this shunt resistor here? Normally that would be the positive pad, but it is not. That is the negative pad. Newbie drone. Put a plus and a minus here, please. Put a plus and a minus so I can see them on the top side. Someone is going to fry their ESC by getting that wrong because they didn't flip it over. pleased with that to tell you the truth. I don't think that's too bad. Yeah, I'm sure the soldering whizzes in the audience will tell me it's terrible. That's okay. Now the motors come with their own screws. It's kind of cool. I just can think of uses for that. Save these. Save these guys. Yeah. Oh, look. The packaging. Oh. Pay 50 cents for that in a store. <laughs> Where's my motor screws, though? I'm 3 by 8 millimeter. Let's see if Newbie Drone is smart enough to have the right length motor screws for their own motors and their own frame. You would think that this would go without saying, but not necessarily. It looks pretty good. 8 millimeter. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Well done, newbie drone. You passed the test. Now, I really wish that they included cap head. Motor, motor manufacturers always include cap head screws, okay? Because these button head screws here, they get stripped out and scuffed off way too easily. They do. Include cap head. My, my, my preference. The other thing I would say is frame manufacturers should include the motor screws with the frames because the motor manufacturer doesn't know how thick your arms are, but the frame manufacturer does. So the motor manufacturer shouldn't include the motor screws. The frame manufacturer should. If you think about it, you'll see I'm right. All right, motors are installed and I went ahead and ran the camera wire underneath the ESC. And I think the right way to do this is going to be to run these back and around so that they go on the back side of the arms and they come around to here. And I do think they're going to reach. Let's go ahead and install the camera so it's not just flopping around here, getting in the way.
camera does have an up facing arrow make sure you get that facing up although you can flip the camera in software too so that's all right if you take, don't mess it up but just check it so i can't quite figure this out the camera has two screw holes the way this mount is i'm not sure i can get both the screw holes to line up so i wonder if it's maybe designed for just a single mount like i could get them both to line up but the camera would be sort of pointed downward and that can't be right so, yeah, maybe it's just designed to take one. Not sure about that. I'm going to go ahead and install these all the way in the back, and we'll see if the camera can pick up these side plates in, its, in this view. If it can, I'll push it forward slightly. But in general, you want the camera as far back as it'll go without seeing the side plates uh, because that gives it the most protection. Next, we're going to solder up the motor wires, and basically... If you've never done this before, three motor wires per motor position. The front left goes to front left. One, two, three. One, two, three for the back right, front right, and back right. It doesn't actually matter which wire goes where. Um, different arrangements of wires will make the motor spin clockwise or counterclockwise, but you can also just switch that afterwards in software, and that's what I'm going to recommend we do. So I'm just going to wire these up sort of in the neatest way straight through. What I like to do is just get some electrical tape. If you want to be a little neater, you can do it with heat shrink, although you would have needed to put the heat shrink on the arms before you installed the arms. And that's why I use electrical tape, because I'm sloppy like that. And here's what I'm going to do. Kind of bundle these together and tape them. back of the arm so here you can kind of see one has kind of crept up on top of the arm but just kind of pinch them together and snug it up yeah perfect and the reason I do that is that the prop is going to be spinning this direction and if the pop if the prop hits something and bends downward it'll strike the arm and it can cut the wires but if the wires are placed on the back side of the arm, then the prop can't hit them. Hey guys, Joshua from the future here. Uh, the Newbie Drone flight controller comes set for reversed prop direction by default, not standard prop direction. If you intend to keep it that way, then you would need to put the wires on the front of your arms, not the rear. If you do decide to use standard prop direction, put the wires like I show them here, but then when we get to the check motor direction part way at the end of the video, you'll need to do standard motor direction instead of reversed. I've just realized I really need to put the capacitor on this guy, um, especially because this is a 6S build we're using. If it was 4S, you might get away with not having the capacitor, but for 6S, you always want to install the capacitor. The ESC comes with a capacitor. It is 35 volt, 470 microfarad. That's about the minimum what you want. If you happen to have a 50 volt, 1000 microfarad, that would be even better. Um, 35 volts is, uh, that's a minimum you would want. But um, let's go ahead and solder this guy on as well. This capacitor has a negative and a positive leg. The negative leg is marked by this white stripe and the negative symbol here. The positive leg has no such thing. The positive leg is also longer, but you're going to cut it off, so you're not going to be able to rely on that. It's very, very important that negative goes to negative and positive goes to positive. Otherwise, the first time you plug in, you'll hear a loud bang as the capacitor blows up. It's kind of cool, actually. Now, this is a little bit of an advanced technique. But here's how I like to solder these. I, I don't know how else you would do it. Some uh, ESCs will have separate pads for the capacitor. Is this one? That would be so cool. I, well, yeah. So actually, we can solder on top of these joints, just basically like so. And that's how a lot of people would do it. You just add a little extra solder on top. But it's risky because if you flow the whole joint then the whole thing pops off and it's not too hard if you know how to do it there is also a v and a g pad here and since we're not using those we could solder there although they're so close together it's it's going to be pretty tricky i think i'm not going to do that i'm going to solder here you can solder the capacitor with a wire too but it doesn't perform as well if it's not directly connected we're going to just gently build up a blob 
of extra solder on top without applying enough heat to flow the whole thing. And then, while holding this in place, yeah, it could be a little shorter. Well, I'm gonna heat it until that starts to flow. And there we go. And move the whole thing over. There we go. Good. <clears throat> now you probably couldn't see what happened there. And I'm not sure I could explain it to you if I did, but I know that's not very helpful. Uh, I just don't know how to explain this technique other than you just touch it and you watch it start to melt from the top and you just wait till it kind of halfway melts and push the leg down inside and then take the heat away so it solidifies again. But if it starts to melt down and it completely melts, then the, the wire pops off the pad and you don't want that. Just one of those things I've been doing so long that I know how. If you were here, I would teach you how to do it, but there's no way I could show it on camera. Sorry. So the um, the ESC pads are kind of cupped. They have a little bit of a C shape. Maybe if we lay the wire in sideways and come at it from the side, that would work better. Yeah, so basically I'm talking about instead of kind of coming like this, kind of coming like that and letting it lay in. Because like this one especially, I'm not super proud of. I'm going to leave it, though. I'm not proud of it. Yeah. I think those ones I did coming in from the side are a lot better. So, anyway. Yeah, anyway. All right. Four motors soldered up. I do strongly recommend the technique where you lay the wire vertically into the cup, into the C, that works so, and then just bring the soldering iron in from the side and kind of nestle it in. That works so much better than trying to kind of come in at an angle from the top. It just comes straight down to the side. Anyway. Um, boom, soldered up four motors. We are way closer to done than perhaps you think. There's this small wire. This goes to the ESC. Um, it's gonna, should have plugged that in already. Now my wires are, there we go. It's gonna go in here. It does have an up and a down. It's keyed, so don't force it. If you force it, you could damage the plugs or pins, the pins. See, that's not the right way flip it over that's the right way okay I like to give this just a little twist um, just to take up some of the slack here where's the front oi on the flight controller there's a front facing arrow here it is it's kind of hard to see with all this nonsense on here but it's gonna be facing the front we'll give this some twists and we also want to make sure we don't pinch oh well, next next issue is, see there's no, yeah, there's no room there. So what we need to do is, I see why they've included these. So they've included these little guys with the ESC and that's gotta be just as spacers here. So we'll just stuff those on. We've got the screws here. We're just gonna slightly compress these standoffs and get a screw. Get a nut, a nut, not not a screw, a nut. And I'm going to recommend you try to get it basically flush with the top of the screw. That'll get enough compression on those uh, gummies that it, it's tight and it won't back off. And then finally, the flight controller comes with this long wire. One end goes here in the flight controller. Again, be careful to put it in the correct side up if it shows any resistance don't force it just flip it over and wiggle it slightly and find the there we go you can bend those pins if you're and hmm, I wish I had run this underneath because that's where I think it's the neatest place to go let's see if I can make this fit yeah it'll go and again I like to give this some twists to take the slack out a little bit There 
we go. It doesn't need to be super tight, but just enough to take the slack out just a little bit. And then that's going to plug here in the back. There we go. Now I'm going to pull the rest of that slack up here into the body so it's not hanging out the back of the quad. And then kind of just tuck it down into this empty space here. Boom. We're done. We're mostly done. Uh, let's see. What's left to do? So it looks like the way we got to do this is we got to push this through. There's just a little. But then how do you get it? In? You have to cut it. There's no way it can go through there. On this 3D printed piece, the antenna holder, one of them is just basically split the whole way down. And that lets the antenna. Oh, great. I'm tearing it. Great. That's, that's freaking great, Joshua. The other one <laughs> clearly has a bridge here that per I can't figure out how you would get the antenna down in. So I'm just going to cut the bridge there. And that will just let the antenna kind of lay down in there like so. The antenna just goes down in there like so. And we can add some tape or a zip tie or something later to uh, secure that. But in fact, I think what I'm going to do right now is just add a zip tie right here to hold that in place while I work with it. Then the question is, how does this go? Obviously, they have to, is it like that? No, it has to be up. They have to like go to the side, I think. Try stuffing this on here and then figure it out from there. Okay, so now that's in place. Well, okay, that seems to have gotten it. That was tricky. Um, it seems pretty secure though. Oh, yeah, you can give them a little twist and kind of try and take the tension out of it, I guess. But there you go. So then we put the top plate on and we install the six millimeter screws in all the standoffs. And we put the battery pad on. Very nice that they've included a custom cut battery pad. Yeah, it's gonna go here. And oh, that's good too. That's kind of gummy. That's very nice. And we'll grab one of my favorite newbie drone battery straps and I mean, ideally we'd be able to, oh, very nice. Can it go all the way through? Even the thick part? No, it can't. We just gotta pass it underneath like that. If you have a thinner battery strap, you can run it through here and it'll be okay, but that's fine. Battery strap, good idea to run two battery straps if you can, because two will hold more than twice as good as one. The other one would go like here. There we go. Now that the assembly of the quad is finished, we got to set it up. And the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to take this over to your computer. You're going to want to use the DJI FPV Air app. Or is it DJI FPV Air 2? Or there's a bunch of DJI apps for PC, depending on which DJI quad you've got. And they're all different apps, and it's super frustrating. I'm going to put a link to the correct app if this is the first time you've worked with DJI FPV. I'm going to put a link to that app. You're going to download that app. Set up your account. Give all your personal information to China, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> That's just a joke. And um, and you're going to want to plug this guy in and update the firmware. It should be pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to like walk you through the steps. It's not rocket science. One thing you do need to know is that you do have to plug in the quad before. You can't just plug in USB on the air unit. It won't work. You have to plug the quad in. Before you plug the quad in, it is a good idea to do a safety check with a multimeter and you just want to make sure that there is no continuity between these pins and there isn't so here we've got the goggles and the controller by the way if this is the first time you've got the controller you have to leave it on charge until it gets to full charge before it will turn on they ship it in a like a disabled state for safety when you when i first got mine i was so confused i was like it's at half charge why won't it turn on you got to fully charge it first we're going to power up the goggles I'm just using a 4S LiPo. You can use anything up to a 4-cell LiPo to power the goggles. 
and we're gonna power on the quad. When the goggles have finished powering up, we're gonna go ahead and press this red button here. The goggles will begin beeping. We got green light on the air unit. We're gonna press again and it's bound. Next, we're gonna power up the transmitter and to put it into binding mode, we press the record button, this button, and this center click here all at the same time. It's now in binding mode, it's blue, and same thing on the air unit. By the way, it is important that you bind the goggles first and the controller second. I'm not really sure why this is, but if you bind the controller and then the goggles, the controller bind will be lost and you'll have to do it again. No, nope, nothing will be broken. You'll just have to do it again. Now at this point, you should have image in your goggles and perhaps it'll even be ready to go. Like if Newbie Drone is really smart, they've shipped their flight controller totally ready to go and all I have to do is like flip one switch and it'll arm. <gasps> Well, how about that? Uh, we're not done yet though. First, we're gonna go back to Betaflight and we are gonna check the configuration of this and I'm gonna tweak it a little bit from the way Newbie Drone shipped it because that's just how I am. And you may wanna follow along with that. But even if you decide not to follow along with that, we have to make sure that our motors are spinning the right direction. If we don't check that, this quad is gonna flip out when you try and fly it. You must do that step. So over to the computer we go. Over here at the computer, there are two programs we're gonna be working with. One is Betaflight and one is BL Heli. Betaflight is used to configure our flight controller. BL Heli is used to configure our ESCs. And as much as you might've been hoping that by buying a DJI quad, you don't have to mess with any of this, I'm sorry to say there's no escaping it. Now, if you've already got Betaflight and BL Heli installed on your machine, you're ready to go. If not, there is another video I've got, it's linked down in the video description that walks you through the steps of getting Betaflight and BL Heli and the appropriate drivers all installed and set up. We're gonna assume that at this point you have done that. I'm gonna go ahead and start Betaflight and I'm gonna plug into the USB on my flight controller. I'm also gonna plug in my battery and make sure that your props are off for safety. This is essential. Having plugged in your flight controller, you should see a new COM port appear right here in this menu. I've got COM3, I'm gonna hit connect. If you don't see a new COM port appear, it probably means either your drivers are not installed right or your USB cable may be messed up. Try a different USB cable. Next, we're gonna to go to the motors tab right here. And we're gonna tick this checkbox. I understand the risks, the propellers are removed, they better be. And we're gonna raise these sliders one by one and we're gonna check two things. First, we're gonna check that when we raise slider number one, motor number one spins. Just look at the diagram here. This is the front of the quadcopter right here. I've got it oriented the same way relative to this camera. So when I raise slider number one, the back right motor should begin to spin and it does. The second thing we're going to check is the direction of the motor. This motor needs to be spinning counterclockwise. We're going to double check that. I find it helpful to double check that just like with a little scrap piece of paper because sometimes touching it with your finger, it's not always clear which way it's spinning. And it is spinning counterclockwise all as well. Motor number two, front right motor spinning clockwise. That is correct. It is spinning clockwise. So far, so good. Motor number three. Back left, and it needs to be spinning clockwise. It is not spinning clockwise. Okay, so we need to reverse the direction of motor number three. I'm gonna remember that. And motor number four. Motor number four is also spinning the wrong direction. So for me, motors three and four need to be reversed. That is probably not the same for you because the exact direction the motor spins depends on how you wired up the wires and you probably didn't wire up your wires the same as me. At this point, there are two choices for what to do. One thing you can do to reverse motors is to swap any two of the three motor wires with each other. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a real pain in the butt. If you're real good at soldering, that may be the easiest thing to do. 
I prefer to do it in software. Let me show you how. The first thing we need to do is disconnect in Betaflight. If Betaflight's connected, this won't work. There we go. And we're going to go ahead and run BL Heli Suite 32. You downloaded it, installed this previously in that other video, right? Okay. From here, we're going to select the COM port, whichever one that appeared when we plugged in the flight controller back then. We're going to hit connect. And we're going to hit read setup. So far, so good. We need to reverse motors three and four. Here's how to do that. You're going to go down to this section and right click on motor three or whatever motor you need to reverse. Then you're going to go here where it says motor direction and change it from normal to reversed and hit right setup. We're going to do that same thing in my case for motor number four. Right click on the four, motor direction reversed, right setup. Now that is actually all you need to do in order to make the motor spin the right direction and make your quadcopter able to fly. But there is one more thing, two more things that I think we should do as long as we're here that will help us get the nicest, smoothest flying out of the ESC and the motors. Uh, and that is to change motor timing. Oh, hang on. First of all, I'm going to left click to turn all of them on again. And then we're going to change motor timing to auto and PWM frequency to 48 kilohertz. If you want to know more about what that is, I've got videos about BL Heli 32. I've got a whole playlist about it. But for now, just take my word for it that for a smooth flying freestyle quad, this is where I always start. It's not always where I end up, but it's always where I start. And then we'll hit right setup. Okay, we're good to go. Now, before you run and fly, stay with me. There are a few more things I want to walk you through. First, we got to check and double, just double check that we fixed the motors. I know you think you did, but sometimes you screwed it up. Sometimes I screwed it up. And you know what we'll do? Here's what we'll do. We'll just raise this master slider just a little bit. So all four motors begin to spin and we'll check the direction. Back right motor is spinning counterclockwise. Good. Front right motor is spinning clockwise. Good. Back left motor is spinning clockwise. Good. Front right motor counterclockwise. Good. All the motors are spinning the correct direction. The next thing I want to do is I just want to check the receiver settings. This should be set up correctly from Newbie Drone, but let's double check and make sure it's all good. So we turn the transmitter on and the green light appears showing it's bound. And then we should see that these transmitter channels start moving when we move the sticks. I'm going to ask you to follow along with me on a couple steps without quite explaining what they do, but I want you to set the stick low threshold to 1010. That stick low threshold is set higher than it needs to be for people whose transmitter is not set up right, but DJI transmitters almost always working right out of the box and you can set that lower and it will get rid of some dead band at the bottom of your throttle, if that makes any sense. And we'll come down here to the bottom right and hit save. Next thing I want to check is the flight modes and we've got arming mode and flip crash. Come with me. We're going to set up a few more flight modes that I think are a good idea to set up. First, I'm going to disable hide unused modes. And I am going to add a beeper mode by clicking add range and I'll hit save. Configuration. Accelerometer is off. That's an odd choice. I wonder why he's got the accelerometer turned off. Then you can't do auto level mode. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I never do auto level mode anyway. But we certainly want a beeper mode to be able to make the quad beep at us if we like lose it in the tall grass. Coming back to the modes tab, I'm going to re enable the hide unused modes. I'm just going to check the direction of these switches that they're working like I think. So this is our arm switch. And if we go there, it arms. If we go there, it disarms. I actually like to do this the opposite way. I prefer to push away to arm and pull towards to disarm because I think it's easier to kind of just go disarm in a hurry. So I'm going to actually grab this yellow part here, drag it to the left, and I'm going to hit save. And that's going to change which switch position causes arm versus disarm behavior. For the beeper, I'm going to set this to auto 
and then I'm going to move this left switch, and it's going to automatically pick up that that left switch is aux 4. I'm going to put that switch in the beep position, which again, I'm going to make that be pulled all the way towards me. And then I'm going to move this so it covers that position. And having done that, I'm going to go down and hit save. And so now we should get... Well, the beeper mode is turning yellow, meaning it's active, but it's not actually doing anything. Let's double check flip crash. That's aux 3, which is this switch here. And it's in the all the way down position. And that is where I like flip crash to be. I like this switch to be nothing. Middle position is angle mode, which we're not going to use. And down is flip crash. Okay. That's a good setup right there. I like that setup. You can copy that. Let's go to the configuration tab next. And here in the configuration tab, I want you to enable these two options. And then go and hit save and reboot. Those options are going to let the motors beep at you. Uh, you don't have a beeper on the quad. See, that'll help you find the quad if you crash in the grass or you can't find it or you land somewhere and you just don't know where you landed. There's one more thing I want to do, and that's set up the on-screen display. And the on-screen display can actually appear in your DJI goggles. There's a really nice OSD setup that works really well with the DJI goggles. And I'm going to set up just by copy-pasting these, these lines into the CLI. I'll put those lines down in the video description and you can copy paste them as well. Awesome. I think at this point we are ready to go fly. Put your props on. If you've never put props on before, I have a video about how to put your props on correctly. There is a way to do it wrong and if you do it wrong, it'll flip out. What I recommend you do is put your props on, go out somewhere safe. Don't do this in your living room. Your ceiling will thank you. Put the quad down, put it well away from you, step back 30 feet or so, arm the quad, gently raise the throttle, take off to a hover, and then then you're just good to go fly it. Um, yeah, that's it. If you've flown before, of course, you already know what to do at this point. Thank you so much for coming along on this build. I have really enjoyed making, I love making tutorials like this that walk people through like their very first build. I hope you've enjoyed following along. I've got so many more tips for you on this channel about how to get the most out of your quad. But thanks especially to Newbie Drone and to DJI for making it so freaking easy to get from sort of zero to a ready to fly quad in so many simple steps. Simple steps. Well, relatively simple. Believe me, it's so much more complicated with an analog setup. <laughs> now, if you've gone this far, you probably already bought this stuff. But in case you are about to make a purchase, links to this stuff are in the video description and they are affiliate links. If you click that link before you make any purchase at the affiliated vendor, I get a small commission and it's one of the ways I support myself uh, doing this full time. Thank you so much again for, for uh, following along. That's it. I'm done. Matt, I got to go make dinner with my family. Happy flying, you guys. Thank you.